Hello, my name is Tyler Jaswick, and I'm going to be talking about Isaac's Syndrome. So what is Isaac's Syndrome? Isaac's Syndrome is involuntary and spontaneous contractions of muscles. This syndrome is diagnosed by the spontaneous discharge of potentials on the motor unit originating from the neuromuscular junction. The diagnosis is also supported by an elevated amount of anti-nuclear antibodies within the patient. Symptoms of this syndrome include fasciculations, myokymia, and pseudomyotonia. Fasciculations are spontaneous and uncontrollable contractions of muscle fibers. This is often described as a bag of worms. Myokymia is the involuntary closing of the lower eyelid, and pseudomyotonia is the delayed relaxation of muscle after voluntary contraction. This would be like if you were going to grab a cup, and when you go to release it, you are mentally releasing it, but your hand is still grasped around the cup. Before we begin, I'm going to show you a video of what these fasciculations look like. As you can see in this video, there is a distinct worm-like movement underneath the skin. And shortly here you will see that it contract, I believe, on its own. This can be very painful and it will also prohibit sleep. All right, next we're going to talk about etiology. Isaac's syndrome is an autoimmune disorder. This causes neuromyotonia, which is the hyperexcitability of the peripheral nervous system. Currently, the cause of Isaac's system is unknown, but we do know that some toxins such as herbicides, insecticides, alcohol, and oxaloplatin can cause reversible neuromyotonia. Overall, it is not clear what causes the immune system to function like this. However, the symptoms can be manageable. So how does Isaac's syndrome work? This syndrome is an acquired autoimmune disorder that produces an abundance of antibodies that downregulate voltage-gated potassium channels, which then in turn lead to the repeating of action potentials. Unfortunately, this syndrome does not originate in the peripheral nervous system, so nerve blocks and other type of action potential suppressants do not mediate the symptoms. Instead, the action potential repetitions originate from the synaptic cleft of the neuromuscular junction itself. Basically, this means that the neuron attachment of the muscle has malfunctioned, and this creates involuntary contractions. The prevalence of Isaac's syndrome is extremely rare. Less than 1 in 1 million people have this condition. The age of onset for this condition can occur between any ages between infancy and 60. This condition can occur in all geographical locations and does not affect any specific place or people. Some considerations to observe when looking at this condition is that early in life diagnosis will benefit the individual by creating a better management of symptoms, allowing the patient to live a more normal lifestyle without fatigue or injury. It is important to provide better symptom management in older adults to prevent injury through falls and to allow for daily life activities. This syndrome will exhaust the muscles as well as make it harder to balance due to the fluctuation of contraction, which means that proper symptom management will allow the individual to be more cautious and proceed with their normal daily activities. This also does not affect any specific ethnicity, culture, gender, or race more than the other. So now we're going to talk about related disorders and risk factors. This syndrome is typically accompanied by thymoma, peripheral neuropathies, autoimmune neuropathies, and most commonly myasthenia gravis, which has very similar symptoms to Isaac's syndrome. Roughly 20% of patients have an associated thymoma. This is believed to cause the overproduction of antibodies. The peripheral nerve hyperexcitability can be reversed if this tumor is removed. This syndrome itself is typically not fatal unless it is accompanied by a tumor, and it also depends on the course of this tumor. So how can we treat Isaac's syndrome? Unfortunately, we cannot cure Isaac's syndrome itself. It is not fatal, as mentioned earlier, unless accompanied by a severe tumor. The focus of medical management for Isaac's syndrome is on symptom management, 
or different types of therapies are used to mediate the issues that the patient experiences. Types of treatment usually involve membrane stabilizing drugs, immunosuppressive drugs, and plasma exchange. The purpose of membrane stabilizing drugs is to help prevent the repetitive firing of the action potential. This is done by increasing the difficulty that it takes to change the membrane potential. The purpose of immunosuppressive drugs is to reduce the downgrading of voltage-gated potassium channels. What this means is it reduces the amount of antibodies that downgrade the voltage-gated potassium channels. Plasma exchange is more significant in the malignant form of Isaac's syndrome and helps regulate the amount of antibodies in the patient. And the other types of medical treatments include sodium channel blockers and immunotherapy. Condition-related precautions for Isaac's syndrome. Precautions for patients with this condition will be fall management due to general muscular stiffness that prohibits balance control, as well as muscle soreness. Also, muscle stiffness can get so powerful that upper and lower extremities can be so contracted that they are actually unusable. This is very important because this means we will have to focus more on ADLs such as bathing, feeding, and donning. To demonstrate what these people go through in their daily lives with Isaac's syndrome, we will be doing an activity where we will contract the arm into an uncomfortable position and try to draw a jack-o'-lantern. For this activity, all you're going to need is a piece of paper and a writing utensil. First, I would like you to fully extend your elbow and then maximally flex the wrist. From here, make a fist and just hold it tight. Now, use your other hand and place your writing utensil however you'd like into your hand. You can place it over the top or underneath. Or if you can find a better way, go ahead and do that. Now that we have this position, hold your arm just like this and we're going to try and write a jack-o'-lantern primarily using the shoulder to move your arm. Now that I'm in this position, I'm going to attempt to draw a jack-o'-lantern. And there we go. As you can see, I have drawn a jack-o'-lantern, and that was probably the most difficult thing I've ever done. If you would like, you can try to draw another one, but I'm actually pretty proud of this one. And to conclude my presentation, here is my reference list. Thank you for watching.